My great pleasure and honor of introducing our keynote speaker for this conference, Professor James uh, C. Hathaway. Welcome, Professor Hathaway. Um, Professor Hathaway is the James and Sarah Degan Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. He is the founding director of Michigan Law's program in refugee and asylum law and the distinguished visiting professor of international refugee law at the University of Amsterdam. As you may know, uh, Professor Hathaway is a leading authority on international refugee law. His work is widely cited and thought by academics, instructors across the globe, including myself. His work is also regularly cited by the most senior courts of the common law world. He regularly provides training on refugee law to academic, non-governmental and official um, audiences around the world. So it's a, truly a privilege to have you uh, delivering our keynote. Professor Hathaway, the floor is yours. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Atak, and, and thank you to all of your protect colleagues for inviting me to, to join you. I must say it's, it's slightly sad for me not actually to be in Toronto, as I'm sure it is for many. Uh, I lived there for some 20 years and had hoped this was a pretext to return to my homeland. As you'll see from the backdrop, uh, if those of you who may recognize that I'm still on the west coast of Canada, we like to think of it as Canada's prettiest city uh, in Vancouver. Uh, and I'm happy that at least with the miracle of Zoom, we can be sort of almost together this morning. What I wanted to do today is something that I initially thought the conference organizers wouldn't be very happy about uh, because I read the profile uh, of PROTECT, which obviously is deeply embedded in the global compact process. Uh, and I actually asked uh, Idil, I said, are you sure you want me to speak? Because I'm probably the leading critic of the global compact process. Uh, and is that a voice that you want really to have in a meeting designed to think about how to make good from the global compact? And, and, and to her credit, uh, Professor Atak simply said, yes, that's exactly what we'd like. We want a lively conversation. And so I'm going to give you a, a no holds barred, uh, very frank uh, presentation uh, about why, uh, as you'll see from the title on the screen, I think the global compact is actually a global cop out on refugees. It is the opposite uh, of what was needed. So let me begin. I really just want to. Uh, uh, make two points this morning, uh, which will relieve you probably. Uh, the first point is that uh, sticking with the status quo refugee protection system is simply not an option. The second point is that the thin version of protection reform that is being championed by the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, under the 2018 Global Compact is a losing proposition, both for refugees and for the predominantly poor states that receive them. So that's really all I'm gonna to say today. And if you wanna sign off now, uh, you, you, you know my views, but I'll try to adumbrate each of these two points. And then, uh, because I think it's incumbent on those who criticize to offer an alternative, I'm gonna give you a very brief outline uh, of what, in my view, a good alternative would look like. So let's start with the first point, uh, the mess that we're in. Uh, we all know states really, really don't like it when refugees use smugglers uh, to arrive unannounced at their borders in this kind of disorganized way you see on the screen. But honestly, does anybody think, if they just pause for a moment and move outside of the rhetoric, does anyone think that refugees like putting themselves into the hands of smugglers. I mean, would you want to be in this situation that you see on the screen? And I'm quite confident the answer is none of us would want to be in this situation. But when there's no access to meaningful asylum closer to home, resort to a smuggler or indeed even to a trafficker may be the least bad option in order to survive. Putting it really crudely, better a 50-50 chance of surviving the Mediterranean than the near certainty of indentured servitude in Eritrea or ongoing bombing in Syria 
or life under the Taliban in Afghanistan. I would take that choice. And I think any reasonable person would. Refugees who are guilty of absolutely no crime other than seeking to survive. Exercising the right to asylum, and I wanna emphasize this, that we established, we were the ones who said there was a right to seek asylum. We codified that right. When refugees exercise that right, they too often confront horrific conditions like what you see on the screen. And yet states overwhelmed by sudden arrivals of refugees, often in distant places in their territory, struggle to find dignified conditions of reception, leaving refugees literally stuck in the mud, if not worse. Most refugees want to lead productive lives. They want to look after their own needs. They want to look after their families. They actually want to make a contribution to the place where they go. But while the numbers have gone down, it is still the case that roughly one out of every three refugees are stuck in horrible places like what you see on the screen, camps where they can make no contribution to even their own welfare, much less a contribution to the neighboring community. And even when they can escape the hellhole of refugee camps, most refugees are presently forced to eke out an existence in equally hellish urban slums. That's proclaimed to be progress by some. There are fewer in the camps, but I don't see this as progress at all. It's trading one hellhole for another. The developed world squanders unconscionable sums of money every year to run this completely dysfunctional system. And I want you to think carefully about the amount of money that's involved and how it's spent. Rich countries right now spend more money to manage and process the 15% of refugees who get to their territories than is available to meet the needs of the 85% of refugees who are in less developed countries. Indeed, the OECD states alone spend $20 billion, billion dollars each year just to run their asylum systems for just 15% of the world's refugees. That is four times what the UN has available to support the 85% living in poorer countries. That's not even on the ethical Richter scale. And when we talk about reform, we have to start from where we are. This is how bad things are. Even worse, there are now nearly 16 million refugees, three quarters of the world's refugees, who've been waiting, again, focus on this number, who've been waiting an average of 20 years for a solution to their refugeehood with no prospect of a solution in sight, the so-called protracted refugees. Of the 15.7 million refugees in the world, fewer than one third of 1% are resettled in every, any given year and only by a tiny number of countries. So an absolutely critical part of the protection journey, getting a new life when going home proves impossible, is being completely ignored under the current system. The bottom line then is that the current system, in my view, is a complete mess. It is risky for refugees and for states. It is chaotic. It's debilitating. It's absurdly expensive. And it doesn't produce solutions for most refugees. Why would we even consider sticking with that approach? As one of my corporate law colleagues put it, if this were a corporation, the auditors would tell it to file for bankruptcy tomorrow. Yet to the extent that anybody is actually suggesting change, the change that is being proposed is decidedly thin. And this brings me to my second point. A thin version of reform like the Global Compact on Refugees is just not worth pursuing. All it does is to paste a veneer of progress 
over the reality of substantive dysfunctionality. Rather than having the gumption to propose, for example, a truly binding protocol to remedy the operational deficiencies of the Refugee Convention, and I wanna be clear, I believe in the Refugee Convention. I do not want to amend the Refugee Convention. But what we need is a binding, not a voluntary, a binding operational protocol that would enable us to do the convention in a different way. That's what UNHCR should have put on the table instead of the so-called compacts, which if you haven't watched Dario Mazzola's presentation, he explains is not binding. It's, I don't know what it is. It's a rhetorical device. It is a plan. It is an invitation. It's what lawyers would call an invitation to treat. It's not a contract. It's not a treaty. So if you really wanted to fix the problems, you don't propose something as flimsy as that. And when you actually look at the operational mechanism of the global compacts, what's called the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, you can see just how thin this really is. First of all, it doesn't even apply to most refugees. It only applies to what are called large movements of refugees. Now, this is a fascinating thing, right? The most critical term in the whole operational mechanism, large movements of refugees. How big is that? We're not told. How large is large? Is it 1,000, 10,000, 100,000? I mean, Australia thought 300, rival, uh, 300 refugees was a mass arrival. Tanzania once admitted a million refugees in 36 hours. Whose definition of large applies? We don't know. And even if it is somehow deemed to be a large situation, not a small medium situation, then all we get are a bunch of guideposts which would normally contain these elements. There's no rule about what happens even if you do fit into the large movement category. So what, what we've been offered is the thinnest of thin reforms. Even if it gets the large label, which will you know, require, what we're gonna get is a need to negotiate each and every time a situation happens based normally on the elements here. So put that in the context of what's happening in Afghanistan right now. Have you seen this rolled out? Have you seen this be ready to go into motion? I mean, they haven't even gotten together yet, much yet, much less figure out what rules ought to apply, how, when, and where. That's how disastrous this agreement to agree actually is. All that we're definitely going to get out of this is a whole lot of meetings. We're going to have global refugee summits. We're going to have national steering groups. We're going to have solidarity conferences. We're gonna have global support platforms. We're gonna have host country consultative mechanisms. We're gonna have regional consultative mechanisms and don't feel left out. Yes, there's a global academic network. We are all part of the co-optation project. There is going to be lots and lots and lots of chatter. Does anybody imagine that an international bureaucrat might have designed this system? Why then were we presented with such a legally tepid response when the need for decisive action was so clear? Why a thin approach to protection and reform when something robust is clearly what was needed. When the system is on life support, you don't put on a Band-Aid. UNHCR defends its timid approach on the ground that the current political environment is simply not receptive to big picture reform. It makes more sense, argued Volker Turk, Volker Turk to consolidate traditional standards and to set up a voluntarist framework to at least get states talking about sharing burdens and responsibilities. If we tried to do more, we would just fail. 
And in fairness to UNHCR, there are some academics who might well agree with that analysis. For example, leading human rights scholar Michael Ignatieff has explicitly advocated what he calls a thin approach to global justice on the ground that there really is no global normative consensus on what he calls the one world perspective. Wow. Perhaps even more confronting, Harlan Cohen has recently argued that the viability of multilateralism may really be in decline, that it required a big powerful country or two that could push others to come on board and that in a multipolar world, there just isn't that ability to persuade states to come on board. And therefore, all we're going to get is smaller deals, as he puts it. And yet, while these rules seem, while, while, while these analyses seem to align with UNHCR's rather timid, thin approach, I want to suggest to you that when you actually engage with what scholars like uh, Ignatieff and Cohen have said, the result will be exactly the opposite of what UNHCR did. Superficially, the analyses seem to support the global compacts. Substantively, it actually goes in the opposite direction. So take Ignatieff, for example. When he says that we don't share a language of the good or a global ethic, but rather only a desire in a local vernacular to make our lives meaningful, what he calls ordinary virtues. He applies that to asylum and says, the problem with that is that there's no upward limit to how many refugees a state has to accept. And that if you demand an unlimited intake from states, the localist imperative is gonna be perceived as a threat to their sovereignty. Now this is confronting to a lot of us uh, steeped in the language of human rights, but, but suspend disbelief for a moment and look at what Ignatieff is actually saying. It does not say that asylum can't work under an ordinary virtue optic. What it actually says is that the current approach to asylum, where accidents of geography determine who has responsibility to protect on an indefinite basis cannot work. If it's an unlimited and one-sided obligation, it is not going to work. On the other hand, what we need to do is to widen the circle of concern, he says, and the way we do that is by diffusing the problem. If the perceived problem is that there is no limit to the number you're required to receive, that is an issue that we can, and in my view, should address. And when we do that, the system becomes viable. That should have been what the global compact process aspired to. Similarly, when Cohen questions the continuing appeal of multilateralism, he also says, this is especially true when we fail to take account of local needs and interests. I think he's right. But the answer to that is not to come up with some rhetorical global compact. It's to take account of those local interests in a binding system that people can rely on. So my point then is simple. If, if you take the view, as UNHCR appears to do, that it's unwise to assume a strong commitment to human rights or multilateralism, then you should be advocating exactly the opposite of what UNHCR put on the table. If you think the commitment to human rights is in retreat, then the answer is not a thin version of protection in which all we do, and this is all the global compacts do, is pay lip service to burden and responsibility sharing. You instead actually clearly put a binding operational mechanism to share burdens and responsibilities in place. And if you take the view that the commitment to multilateralism is in decline, as Cohen does, then what you do is you come up with a system that shows how this can deliver at the local level. Again, not a vague rhetorical platform. So in, in case I have not been clear, 
the very last thing we should be doing, in my view, is buying into the UNHCR's vision of an endless procession of voluntarist pledging conferences that may or may not deliver. Do you honestly think that countries are joining Afghanistan are going to keep their borders open because some UN bureaucrat says, oh, golly, we've got a global compact. Hmm, we could convene a meeting. Hmm, well, I think this is large. It's pretty large. Hmm, these elements normally apply. Gee, are they going to apply now? How long is this going to take? And how many people are going to be dead in the interim, thanks to the inability of the international system to respond quickly and dependably. To make it even worse, it's hard to imagine, but to make it even worse, the way the UNHCR has proceeded robs us of the ability to actually make that big picture change. Because what they say is instead of replacing the old one by one by one inefficient asylum system with a globalized system of protection, UNHCR says you have to do both. This is on top of, in addition to, everything you're already doing. So all of that money that I talked about, the $20 billion a year being spent by rich countries on refugee reception, can't be harvested in order to do what's really needed to make the world system work. It is literally the worst of all possible worlds. Now, I guess the simple answer is, I'm, what I'm saying is the best defense to worries about human rights and multilateralism is really a good offense. Make protection real, robust, reliable, not thin. Get your head out of the proverbial sand and offer a vision that not only delivers more and more dependably for refugees, but also firmly ends once and for all the ridiculous accidents of geography approach to the allocation of burdens and responsibilities, and which delivers real benefits to the host communities who receive refugees. To quote a certain someone, yeah, we can do this. I mean, ironically, since this meeting is coming from Toronto, it is almost exactly 25 years ago now that a team of more than 100 people from around the world, equal numbers from Global North and Global South, social scientists, scholars, NGO activists, and yes, six governments, all came together and offered a platform for doing precisely this. A proposal that has been sitting on the UNHCR shelf now for a quarter century. So what we don't need, in my view, is a series of vague guiding principles. And what we don't need is a never ending conversational loop of talk shops. So let me then move to the third part of what I want to say today. I promised you that I would give you at least a thumbnail sketch of that alternative that was devised a quarter century ago in order that I can hopefully stimulate you to look at it one more time and to think about how those ideas, admittedly not perfect in 2021, but the basic benchmarks can and I think should be applied now to reinvigorating the refugee system. And I'm gonna give you five benchmarks and explain to you why I believe this is a workable program. And yes, okay, I know. The roadmap is a tired metaphor, but it kind of sort of works. So, so bear with me. First point on the highway, which by the way, is not even mentioned in the global compacts. By the way, one other point, global compact on refugees, not global compact for refugees. The drafters knew precisely what they were doing. This is a compact on refugees. The word access, which is the most important thing for refugees, is not even mentioned. There is nothing about enabling the human beings concerned to get to the thing that we call protection. 
So we've got to get rid of barriers to access. Now I know you're saying, oh yeah, yeah, pie in the sky, typical legal academic. You know, this is not gonna happen. But bear with me for a moment. Why do states put barriers to access in place? They spend billions and billions of dollars every year to deter refugees from doing what international law allows them to do. Why? Because if a refugee arrives on your territory, she is 100% your responsibility, right? There is a perverse logic to deterrence. If everyone who arrives is my responsibility and no one else owes me anything, and I'm afraid of that, yes, I will invest in deterrence. But imagine if that were not the case. If arrival simply marked the entry point into an international system and had no domestic immigration consequences at all for that state, would it really make sense to invest billions of euros or dollars every year in that program? The government officials with whom I've spoken say no. The reason we do it is because there are direct consequences for us. If there were no consequences, then obviously that would be a bad investment. Why spend billions of dollars every year to deter something that has no consequences for you? That then leads to my second point. When refugees would arrive, they would be met with internationally run and normally group-based status assessment, quick and simple in the overwhelming number of cases. And I know this will offend my asylum lawyer friends. I mean, I am one of you, I've taught you for 40 years, but the truth is our systems are slow and absurdly expensive. And they only work for a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the world's refugees. Again, we spend four times more on the 15% who get into these systems than on the 85% who don't. So I'm suggesting a move to a very simple, largely group-based status assessment system. We do not need a fancy bells and whistles hearing to figure out, for example, that a Syrian is a refugee. We then allow the United Nations to allocate and move refugees to receive what I call protection for duration of risk. We never say temporary protection because nobody knows if it is or it isn't, but protection for the duration of risk. And this would normally, not always, but normally be in the region of origin in order to maximize functional and cultural compatibility quickly. Yes, exceptions for acutely at risk groups and individuals, unaccompanied minors, et cetera. But normally, what we try to do is to get refugees into a situation where they can again function independently with as little adjustment as possible linguistically, culturally, and occupationally as possible. We would have a system of preference matching where both state preferences and refugee preferences were factored into the system, but we would be starting from predetermined allocation quotas relying on a sophisticated algorithm speedily to match people up. And again, I've just summarized in one minute something that took many years of dozens of people to figure out. I can't do it justice in a quick presentation like this. But the point is the models are out there and they have worked at the local level. They can be made to work globally as well. This would mean that all refugees would get out and into whatever country they can physically get to. And from there, they would be received in a state where they would be protected in a way that would enable them to get on with their lives, at least in the short run. Hopefully with the ability to go home, about a quarter of refugees do still go home. But if not, I'll explain the rest of the process in a moment. The critical piece here is that what I've just described will cause the illegitimate part of the smuggling market to end tomorrow. Why? Because the smugglers would have nothing to sell. If you arrive in Italy, that does not mean you're staying in Italy. Why would you pay for it? And what we would get is a situation in which 
the immigration result that is being falsely sold as part of the asylum process would no longer be marketable. The third point, once the refugees are moved to their place of protection for duration of risk, again, normally within the region of origin with the exceptions that I've described a moment ago, what would happen is what is allowed under the current refugee convention. There would be a very brief moment in which their freedom of movement could be limited to assess their identity and security concerns. But immediately after that, states would be obliged to do what the Refugee Convention requires, namely no constraints on freedom of movement. In other words, no more closed camps. Precisely in line with what the Refugee Convention requires, refugees would be allowed to get on with their lives, setting up businesses, working, educating their kids. All of these things, by the way, are in the current convention. Nothing new is needed. Social science research, and many of you have worked on this, you know what I'm saying, is clear that when, is clear that when we free refugees to contribute, they are only not burdens, but can actually be dynamic engines for development in the host community. Again, we all know the foundational story from Uganda when the government ended constraints on freedom of movement, allowed refugees to work. 21% of urban refugees after two years owned their own businesses and 40% of the people they employed were Ugandans. That's the kind of thing that can be made to work and deliver local value. Fourth point, we need to make the asylum system doable for poor states. Again, the current system of forcing poor countries to hope for charity to fund the costs of processing and receiving refugees would end under the approach that I'm suggesting. Instead, we harness that $20 billion that is no longer needed and guarantee through the international agency the support that host states required contingent by on, on respect by that country for respect for refugee rights. At least as important, the system that I'm proposing would also provide economic startup grants to refugees and meeting Harlan Cohen's concern to the communities that receive them, thus linking refugees to the host communities in the way that the Ugandan experiment showed would work. And again, I wanna be clear, the economists in our study worked through all of the numbers on this. Everything I've just described, international assessment of status, moving people to a place of protection of duration of risk, enabling the host community to process and receive them, supporting refugees and their host communities during that initial phase of protection, all of that would cost less than the $20 billion that we are now spending on status assessment in rich countries, a process that would no longer be needed. In other words, there would be no new money required. Fifth, and I think personally most important, this new system would guarantee a true solution to refugeehood. Again, interestingly, there are no guarantees of solutions in the global compact. There are hopes for it, but when you've got most refugees in the world waiting 20 or more years, you've got a problem that isn't answered by the Global Compact. So if we look over the last 20 or 25 years, in very rough terms, about one out of four refugees is able to go home within five years of leaving. By the way, five years was chosen by a group of uh, psychologists, including refugee psychologists, as the point at which psycho psychosocial damage due to indeterminacy begins to set in for a significant number of refugees. And so they recommended a five-year cutoff point on the protection for duration of risk. And that's what our model builds on. Yes, again, some people will need an earlier solution, but at five years, no one waits any longer. What our model assumes is, Historically, about a quarter of refugees go home. 
if we had the truly empowering system of linking refugees to their host communities that I've described, which has been successful in so many places, perhaps another quarter could be locally received and integrated in that first country. But that still leaves, even if we're right, that still leaves roughly a half of refugees who at the five-year point would not have a solution. And whereas I've mentioned, we have taken the view based on the psychosocial analysis that at that point, a permanent solution needs to be offered. And here's where the truly interesting numbers begin to get crunched. If what we need is a solution for the half of refugees who can neither go home nor be locally integrated at the five-year point, right? What we have now is a resettlement system that is basically no disrespect intended to those who do the hard work, but it is a complete drop in the bucket. 50,000 resettlement places for 16 million people who've been waiting for 20 years or so, it's just not going to cut it. If we actually said that at the five-year point, every refugee would have access to resettlement, we would need 1.7 million resettlement spots each year, not 50,000. 1.7 million. Interestingly, on average, rich countries are getting 1.65 million asylum claims every year, almost the identical number. So what we do is we swap the job of extra regional states from that protection for duration of risk to providing the permanent solution through resettlement. The job of countries outside the region, apart from receiving people in flight while they're being processed, would primarily be to provide permanent homes at the five-year mark for those who can neither go home nor locally integrate. And again, the numbers would be almost identical to what is presently arriving in those states. So hopefully you're asking yourself, could we do this? Is there any historical evidence that this could work? And I'm going to say to you, yes. I mean, for example, in the 1920s, 100 years ago, we let an international agency called the Nansen Office quickly and speedily do status assessment and document that status in a passport that states agreed to recognize. It's not that hard, economically efficient, and it works. Again, States are not going to do that if it has immigration consequences for them, but under this model, it doesn't. Could we really move refugees around the world? Well, again, after the Second World War, the International Refugee Organization distributed refugees from places of arrival to new homes, South Africa, South America, Western uh, North America, Australasia. They had their own fleet of ships, for God's sake. And this was in the 1940s and 50s. If they could do it then, we could do it now. Could we actually have a system that has states working cooperatively, like I've described? Not one by one by one, but part of a common global system. Well, again, during the boat people crisis of the 1970s, we did exactly that with the Comprehensive Plan of Action. We've done it to a lesser extent in Africa under the ICARA process, in Latin America under the Sarefka process. We have set up systems that link states in the region of origin with states far away in which different states do different jobs, what environmentalists call common but differentiated responsibility, which is at the core of the model that I've proposed. Could we actually imagine a massive ramping up of resettlement by richer countries. And again, you know, I have to have one Canadian nationalist photo here. I mean, we proved in the five years ago that we could do that. Canada quickly retooled its system to admit 25,000 refugees in a few short months, sacrificing absolutely nothing on security vetting. All the government did was instead of pursuing seven steps 
sequentially, it pursued them simultaneously. Those efficiencies have now been proved. They could be deployed for the Afghans and others if we simply had the determination to do it. Yes, we could resettle more if what we if that is what we committed ourselves to doing. So this system, I think, and this is where I'll end and then I'll take your comments and questions. I think this is a better system for everyone. This is a better system in particular for refugees. And because I'm a lapsed Catholic, everything will come in threes. Uh, three reasons why it's better for refugees. First, they would not need to put their lives on the line in order to get solid protection. That's the most important thing. Second, protection would really be the empowering rights regarding protection that the Refugee Convention actually calls for, not the purgatory of refugee camps or urban slums. And third, and I think most important, protracted refugee situations end. Every refugee gets a durable solution within a reasonable period of time. I think it's a better system for the countries of the global south that again, host 85% of the world's refugees. First of all, they would no longer have to beg for the charity of wealthier states. They would instead be guaranteed the funds that they need to protect refugees. Second, those funds would go not just to refugees, but also to fund startups linking refugees to host communities so that everyone benefits from the presence of refugees. And third, the states of the global south now receiving 85% of the world's refugees would not be faced with the perverse punishment that the current system now inflicts on them, which is if they do what we ask them and keep their doors open, they are basically stuck with those refugees forever. I mean, talk about a disincentive to act properly. That would end with the guaranteed resettlement option at the five-year point. And last, I think it's also a better system for the developed world. First of all, and if you read the rhetoric from rich countries, the thing they hate most is the smuggling market. Well, this will undermine the smuggling market and reduce the use of the refugee channel for economic migration, because you will never know where you're gonna end up. There is nothing for these people to sell. Secondly, richer countries would get the time that they ask for to vet security concerns before refugees arrive to stay on their territory. We have plenty of time to do that during the protection for duration of risk phase. And third, and I think we just need to be candid about this, that resettlement would give wealthier countries a role that is an easier social fit than is temporary protection. It is easier for us and our social systems to integrate refugees than to have a large group of people who are simply hangers on. So my point is not that this is a ready to roll out slam dunk option, but, but can we be frank? Good ideas rarely are. And if you compare what I've suggested to the Global Compact, does the Global Compact eliminate barriers to access? No. Does it dependably assign refugees to some place to get protection for duration of risk? No. Does it ensure rights regarding protection while you're there? No. Is there a guarantee of burden and responsibility sharing? No. Are there any guaranteed solutions for refugees or for poorer host countries? No. Now that's where we're starting from. And so, you know, we all know the notion that the perfect is the enemy of the good. I urge you that while there are flaws in what I've proposed, and I'm happy to speak with you about those, perfection ought not to be the measure. The measure of relative success is I think what you see on the screen. We are now in a disastrous place where none of the things most critical to refugees is on offer. Those five 
bench points should I think be the measure of relative success. And I hope that you'll join with me in not accepting the global cop-out on refugees that we've been offered, but really insisting on a reinvigoration of binding protection in a way that pursues these five critical goals and does so at its core, dependably, and in a way that is fair to everyone involved. So thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to your comments and your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Hathaway, for this uh, very rich, thought-provoking and inspiring talk. Um, and your criticism of um, the uh, global compacts on refugees are most welcome. You give us a lot of uh, food for thought. <laughs> I would like to open the floor now for uh, questions and comments. And I would like to remind you that you can use uh, the Padlet. You can also use the um, um, uh, chat function that is available. I know that some of the um, attendees can also unmute themselves. Um, if that's the case, please feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. The floor is now open for questions and comments. And, and Adil, if I may ask, I, can we just take one question or comment at a time? Because if they add up, I tend not to do justice to them. Absolutely. Let's do that. And while we wait, maybe I can take advantage of my position as chair and ask you a question. Um, so um, how, what one could explain the resistance of governments and, and some international organizations to the model and the roadmap that you um, just outlined? Uh, it's not the financial reasons, as you said. How can we explain that? Oh boy, that's a great question. And, and, and interestingly, one of the governmental participants in the process who was then the assistant deputy minister of immigration in australia actually came to michigan three years after this to lead a phd seminar on why it didn't work uh, and asked all of these questions and i had to sit there and suffer uh, through a term of watching five years of work by 100 people be unpacked i think her essential point was we didn't have a champion for the project uh, that International agencies were basically, and I don't mean to be cruel, but slightly lazy. They liked the way that things worked, UNHCR in particular, ending the crisis is not necessarily in its institutional interests and having to do the hard job of being the Securities Exchange Commission of Protection would put it in a difficult position vis-a-vis -vis states and it was not keen to move away from its tents and blankets mandate. Uh, Rich states uh, uh, thought they could deter people and they were pretty confident that they could. Now we now know with 25 years experience, they haven't done a very good job of that. Uh, poor countries, I think were less resistant, uh, but overwhelmed by the pressure from the EU and other rich countries. And the only people who were super enthusiastic uh, were the refugee voices, but of course they didn't count. And so that's the problem, right? Um, I think we still need a champion. Who would that be? I mean, this World Refugee Council that's been set up by Canada seemed to offer promise initially, but honestly, the solutions that it's offered are really mild and vague and not operational. Uh, these were people on that group who could have been those champions is what I'm saying. Former presidents, prime ministers and others, uh, we had a chance and, and I fear that we've lost that chance by a very poorly managed process that didn't ultimately deliver. So I think that's my fundamental challenge. Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Anna Trianda Filidou. Um, she says, thank you for the bold plan. I'm all in support for it. I need though to ask some clarification questions. Where will people be assessed in terms of their refugee status? So and they, what will happen to those who, who, uh, to whom status is refused? There's another um, uh, complementary question by uh, Professor Anna Trianda Filidou. Uh, will status can be I, assessed? Can I answer that one first, Adil, just before I forget it? So they would be assessed in whatever state they first arrive. So if they take uh, a boat 
from Syria that ends up in Greece, they would be assessed in Greece by the international agency. And if they are found not to qualify for protection, even under the relaxed group-based standard that I described, yes, they would be amenable to deportation. Mm -hmm. Will status be assessed by international asylum officers? What yeah. happens with sovereignty? Well, but again, so sovereignty is only implicated if there are consequences for you, right? So why would Greece care, just to stick with my example, if United Nations officers did the assessment, did the allocation, did the distribution process at their cost, at their operational problem, all, Greece would have no reason to oppose that. Indeed, they probably would welcome that. They would not have to fund a status system. They would not need to deal with the operational problems. So the idea is indeed an internationalized force that could be moved around the world as crises dictate. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Francesca Longo. Um, thank you for this alternative approach. It is agreeable for us, but how to push states, main actors at international venues, where these decisions should be agreed to move towards this direction. So, so in a sense, I'm going to throw that question back to you. And the reason I agreed to do this presentation was because I, I'm a law prop, right? I'm, I'm not particularly good at, and, and, and the fact that my project was such an abysmal failure speaks to this. Uh, I'm not particularly good at, as Canadians would say, stick handling this through the process. I don't know how to do that. I need those of you who, who are experts on international relations, on international politics, on global governance, on the psychology of making people understand self-interest in a more enlightened fashion. I need advice from all of you. And I need all of you, if you think the idea has basic legs, I need all of us to begin collaborating on how to make that strategy happen because I am one person and I don't have the expertise. We have another uh, pretty long question from Padlet. Could the Global Compact on Refugees be interpreted as a foot in the door policy instrument? A first instrument not necessarily aimed at immediate results, but rather aimed at gradually creating a community with a more common understanding of what is needed, sharing responsibility. Additionally, if a binding instrument is desirable, do you think that reaching an international binding instrument uh, uh, would have been feasible? So it's a, it's a great question and a completely fair question. Um, and, and if we'd been having this discussion, you know, 30 years ago, I think I would have agreed with you. I mean, could it be a foot in the door? Of, of course it could be a foot in the door, right? But it's not as though what was needed was not evident a quarter century ago. And indeed, before my team took this on, Professor Grahl Madsen, in the 1960s, for God's sake, had come up with the basic bare bones of a comparable plan. So what I fear is that rather than being a foot in the door for something, I mean, there's no plan to move this to a binding protocol, by the way. You look for that anywhere in the documentation. There's none. It, it says it's explicitly non-binding. Again, if you watch Dario's presentation, you will see this is a non-binding document. That's explicit. It's not even implied. It is explicitly non-binding. And so if there had been an intention to proceed within two, three, five years to a binding protocol, my sense is they would have said that. But they should have done this a quarter century ago. It's unfair that tens of millions of refugees' lives have been ruined by this incrementalist optic that is belatedly now coming to the floor and which quite frankly, I think that the next generation will be having a conference just like this in 25 years where someone will be saying, hey, here's some good ideas. Let's get a foot in the door and, and let's, start, let's start talking about it. It is not clear to me that there is anything to be learned that we have not already learned over the last 70 years of the refugee convention. It's time to do it now. It's time to get off of this, you know, maybe someday this will happen approach. 
We have another question from Padlet. Uh, you propose a technical solution and mention precedence, but I wonder if in today's world with the resurgence of nationalism and the relevance of identity questions, the best solution would be acceptable for the citizens of a destination country who at the end of the day are the ones who elect the decision makers. Right, and, and so, but this was also clear to all of the contributors to our project Again, I'm sorry to sound like the old guy 25 years ago. That has not changed. It may have intensified, but it's the same phenomenon. That's why preference matching is a part of this process, both for refugees and for receiving states. And there are multiple models of preference matching that have been developed over the last, in particular, five years to show how we can factor in the preferences of refugees and of states and come up with a matching model to enable people to go to places where it is easier to integrate them and for refugees to go to places where it is easier to be accepted quickly. All of that is part of the model, but it needs to be built into, in my view, a binding commitment to give people an option to go somewhere. And that's what we're missing right now. Thank you. We have a question from Apollo uh, who thanks you for the great presentation. Asylum procedures are currently undermined and overwhelmed by high numbers of economic migrants. How do you see this uh, playing out in your proposed model? So, so again, this, this is really an important point, and I think it's one of the real strengths of the model, right? To the extent that, and, and again, I'm not sure I'm going to buy the entirety of the critique, you know, the, the number of bogus so-called refugees uh, claiming asylum is, I think, much smaller than most people say. But there are some. There are clearly some. And why are there some? There are some because there are not economic channels for migration for other than the most talented, sophisticated, and professional refugees. And, and, and quite frankly, my forefathers would have used those channels too. And I suspect I'm not the only one listening to this conference who understands that. But if you really want to stop that, you disaggregate the place of arrival and the place of protection. Again, if you arrive in Greece, but you may find yourself protected in Morocco, what precisely is the immigration economic result that you are seeking? It's not gonna work. So if you actually believe there is such a problem, then you should race for this solution because it will diminish the viability of the asylum channel to deliver an immigration result. Thank you. We have a question from um, Jennifer Heinemann, and uh, Jennifer says, um, hi, Jim, I enjoyed your presentation, but wonder about states that are outside the convention. Much of South and Southeast Asia, Lebanon, T Jordan, Turkey foremost, yet these are some of the biggest refugee hosts in the world. How would, you pro how would your proposal assist refugees in these host states? This, and this is another fabulous question, right? And this is this is actually one of the core functions of UNHCR is to promote accession to the refugee treaty. It has been an abysmal failure for the last decade. There are no new accessions. No one's coming on board, including the critical countries that Professor Heinemann points to. And quite frankly, why would you come on board? You know, if, if I mean, if, if I were India or Pakistan and somebody said to me, would you like to sign the refugee convention? By the way, everyone who arrives is your responsibility and we owe you nothing and maybe you'll get a little charity and maybe you won't. Uh, I, I'd say, are, are you out of your mind? Why would I sign that, right? I've had these discussions in at least half a dozen countries with senior officials of non-signatory states. If you want people to sign on, the answer is to provide an operational mechanism that responds to their needs and concerns that says, no, you're not gonna go bankrupt through this process. No, your host communities are not gonna go unsupported. No, you are not stuck with every refugee who arrives forever. Rather, there's a five-year term limit, if you wish to call it that, after which the rest of us provide physical solutions for the human beings who can't go home or for whom local integration isn't viable. If you wanna bring on accessions, you need to create an inducement. The fact that UNHCR has got nobody to sign on over the last decade makes clear that simply the status quo, and we've had these global compacts for over two years now, no new states. 
I'm mean, they're not convinced by this. Why would you sign on to a vague promise of conferences? And they're not going to. We have another question uh, from Anatrian de Filidou, who asks, who and how will decide what will be the final destination? So assuming a Syrian uh, flees to Greece or an Afghan to Tajikistan, assuming also <clears throat> uh, that we create an international legal order that assigns asylum regardless of the national territory, and assuming that the person receives asylum. So who and uh, how um, the final destination will be decided? So, so much bigger question than I can do justice to in a one minute answer, but the short version of it is there would be pre-existing quotas for both burdens, money, and responsibility people. By the way, unlike the European Union, I think it is completely wrong to mix those two into one formula. The capacity on dollars or euros versus the capacity on people are two completely separate questions. But if you want, for example, my view is the single best uh, contribution to this. Oxfam has put out a proposal merging GDP with rank on the Human Development Index and the Fragile State Index and shown what an underlying quota system could look like. And I really encourage you to read the Oxfam proposal, which is, in my view, brilliant. Better than what I had proposed, let me be clear. Uh, mine was better than Graal Madsen. This is called progress. We get on with things. Within that, we build on work on preference matching, work that Alex, Alex Teitelbaum, Will Jones, and others, for example, have already shown how we make that process functional. Within your quotas, there can be a bidding by refugees and a bidding by states that enables us to maximize the potential for the preferences of each within those quotas to be, uh, to be a happy result for all concerned. Is it perfect? No. But again, the perfect is the enemy of the good. The ground reality is three quarters of the world's refugees are waiting 20 years with no place to go. And so will this have some problems? You bet. Name me a system that doesn't. But if we really believe in some kind of utilitarian balance, where we are now spending four times as much on 15% as on the 85% who have nothing, We've got to begin thinking creatively. We can't simply look for objections. We have to look for positive possibilities in ways that are empirically sound. And I think there is enough evidence now that both the formula and the preference matching systems uh, could be rolled out. Thank you. Uh, we have four more questions, and I suggest that we take them one by one, um, if you agree, Jim. Sure. Okay, um, so the next question is uh, uh, from David Thomas. Um, he's based in Ethiopia, and David asks, how can we manage acculturation stress while integrating refugees with local community? I believe that there should be psychological, social, economic access, but uh, how can we manage cultural difference and other issues while we're working with different refugees from diversified backgrounds? I, I, I'm, I'm not the best person to answer that. Um, and and the, you know, the smartest mark uh, of an academic is to realize his or her own incapacity. I mean, that's why on the team, we actually had people with cultural expertise and cross-cultural integration expertise. The, the, the short version of this was to try to provide positive inducements that would enable refugees and host communities to see value in each other. For example, I visited a project in Nepal where the Bhutanese refugees were linked to the local Nepalese farmers in a joint livestock operation where after three years, they could actually see the value in each other's expertise and were grazing communally. I mean, that's one of millions of examples out there, but I think that's part of it. The other piece to it though, is to respond to the legitimate psychological preoccupations of both groups. For refugees, that means the debilitation of refugee camps or constraints on freedom of movement neuters their ability to feel whole and, and able to contribute. We've got to stop that. And for host communities, it means ensuring that they understand that they will not be penalized for the generosity of opening their hearts and, and minds to the presence of refugees, that there are positive inducements of the kind this model would provide 
that actually enable you as a facilitator to bring the two groups together in peace? And, and that's a poor answer, but it's the best I'm afraid I can offer you. Thank you. A question uh, from uh, Professor Elspeth Guild. Does Professor Hathaway consider that regional free movement of persons regimes, which are developing rapidly around the world, are an alternative? Well, again, are they an alternative? No. Uh, are they part of a remediation of demand? Yes. So, so to the extent that you can move freely, and I think you know the two most interesting examples are Latin America and the beginnings of something in Africa. I mean, Europe has been around for a long time, but the two that are on the move are Africa and Latin America. And obviously, as we've seen already in Latin America, to the extent that you can freely move to another state, you don't need to use the refugee channel. So obviously that's a great idea, but that's not going to end the need for a protection system. What that does is it diminishes the demand on the system, which makes my model even more viable to the extent that the numbers involved, for example, in the residual resettlement are not 1.7 million a year, but only a million or half a million. That just makes it easier. And, and, and so I love the fact that freedom of movement may provide a self-actuating solution for many at-risk people. I'm a big fan of it but I don't think it's going to reach the point that all people are able to move with all of their rights intact in the way that the refugee system enables. I think we need to have both. And a question from Katriona Jarvis, is there an appeal system in this proposed model? Are courts involved at all? So courts are not involved at all. Courts are not, and so, so Katrina, you're, uh, your former colleagues are out of a job. I mean, no. It, 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 it's, it's not a legalistic system in that sense. It's not a bells and whistles. I mean, to spend an average of $20,000 to determine one asylum claim in a rich country is, in my view, as important as that is under the current model, a grotesque misallocation of resources given the needs in the world. And so there would be one assessment and one simple review administratively constructed. That's what I'm proposing. And, and again, is that perfection? Absolutely not. But when most refugees in the world get nothing right now by way of status assessment, I think it's a hell of a big improvement. Question uh, from Hakan Gurjan Sajakan, uh, who is RPI. Um, thanks for this very interesting proposal. It looks ideal to share the responsibility globally. Let's assume that states accept this protocol. However, the Geneva Convention is also binding, yet the states are finding uh, very creative ways of circumventing it. How can we be sure this protocol would work in light of how states try to avoid their refugee convention responsibilities? Yeah, uh, again, another great question, right? And so part of it is, and, and Thomas Gamelthoff Hansen and I have written about this, that there's a bit of a pincer movement happening here. Part of what we have to do, and lawyers have been very good at this, is to eliminate the ability to do deterrence in the ways that 25 years ago convinced rich, rich states that this wasn't in their interest. We are now shutting down bit by bit by bit the viability of deterrence. It feels painfully slow, I know, but it is a useful inducement on states to think about alternatives. It certainly makes the viability of this greater than it was a quarter century ago when people thought the American Supreme Court had said, you can just walk out into the international waters and do whatever the hell you want, there are, there's no law involved. Well, that's just wrong. We know that's wrong now. So part of what, has changed, I think, is that dynamic, right? Why will states think about this now in ways that they mightn't have thought about this before? I think it's just the perennial sense of the whole thing spiraling out of control. And if you could have a managed system, an orderly system that would deliver all of the goods for no more money, and which would give you a role that is a much easier, happier role than what you have now, why would you not think about it? Now, I'm not sure I've done a deal on all of that. I may have lost a bit of that question. If I did uh, come back to me so that I can hit the nail on the head squarely though. Thank you. 
Um, I, I will take one more question before we wrap up. Um, this is from Francis Tom Tamprosa, um, and he says, um, see, uh, agree with the global compact, might have some non-regression aspects. Uh, we have something binding, but we talk now about something that's not binding. This might be dangerous if states think too much uh, about things uh, as not binding. So, and actually this links back to the part of the prior question that I didn't answer properly. Uh, part of the reason that the so-called binding refugee convention is violated in practice is that there are no pragmatic inducements to respect it, right? If you don't do it, what's gonna happen? Oh, gee, in theory, some state could take me to the International Court of Justice, Article 38. It's never happened, right? The problem is there is no, UNHCR going to do what? say tisk tisk with 98% of its budget guaranteed by the same rich states? Is it really going to hammer the countries that do something wrong? I don't think so. So part of the idea of this system is to recreate an international supervisory agency that like a securities exchange commission, if you will, has real power, both carrots and sticks. So for example, poor countries receiving refugees that abuse refugees would not get the economic support and would no longer be a destination site for protection for duration of risk. Rich countries that do not honor their resettlement quotas would still be bound by the refugee convention as they are now and would simply not be able to avail themselves of the flexibility of the protocol. They would lose that. So what we've got to do is to try to create a, but, and the refugee convention remains in force. Let me be clear, clear, clear about this. This is an optional protocol to the Refugee Convention for states that want to try out a collectivized managed system, right? If you don't opt in, you're bound by the current system. So we're not going backwards at all. All this is doing is giving us an option to begin linking states that are in a position to see the value of a more managed orderly system as an alternative to the chaos of accidents of geography and people constantly on the move with no mechanism present to deal with them, security concerns, and most critically, 16 million refugee lives on hold for 20 years. That's not a place where we can stay in my view. And if we don't take a chance on Adam writing something better, then I think we as social scientists are complicit in the failure. We need to be clear that we are not gonna play the co-optation game, that we have waited 70 years for this convention to be operationalized, and that the time is now, it's not 10 years, it's not 50 years, it's now. Refugees deserve that, and so do the countries that receive most of them. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Um, please join me in thanking our keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, James C. Hathaway. This was um, this was a wonderful, very rich, thought-provoking um, thought presentation, and thank you also for taking the time to answer the questions and and also to our comments. Um, thank you so much. So this is the end of today's session for this conference. Uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, Friday, we will start over. Uh, so we will start at 9 a.m. Toronto time, 4 p.m. Berlin time. I hope uh, you will join us. And we have a great lineup of speakers tomorrow as well.